Hello, welcome everyone. This is the third day of Bibliotopia. It's my pleasure to be with Beata Mbiei Meres. Welcome. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind you that the festival, festival is available live on the Foundation website, and you can ask your questions by WhatsApp. All of the procedures to do that are explained on the website. Good afternoon, Beata. You are the author of Tous tes enfants disparus, which was published by Autrement. This is your first novel before you had already published collections of short stories. I'd like to say a few words about you, and that is how we will enter into your text. You were born in 1979 in Boutare in Rwanda. You arrived in France in 1994. Boutare occupies an important place in the book. The book begins on the road to Boutare. Can you describe Boutare to us so that we can familiarize ourselves with it before we begin to talk about the text as such? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you. And we're in Switzerland, so things are not going to be very complicated because Rwanda is often called uh, the African Switzerland. It's hilly, it's very green, uh, high altitudes, lots of lakes. When I saw the lake this morning, it made me think of uh, Rwanda. But it's still an African country. The climate is very pleasant. And Boutare is the second largest city in Rwanda. It was a major university city when I was growing up. Seen from Switzerland, it might seem like a small town with uh, Flemish architecture. As you know, we were a Belgian colony. So when you say 1979, that reminds me a lot of uh, uh, things because it also evokes independence. It's not a very distant past. And uh, perhaps we can talk about the relationship between Switzerland and Rwanda. The book opens uh, with uh, characters taking uh, vo uh, characters' voices being heard successively. We'll talk about those characters as we go along. But at the end of the book, we have uh, a jacaranda. And your images of jacaranda in the book are uh, very important, and they're important with respect to Butari, their presence in Butari. Can you tell us about that? At the outset, I had decided that my title would be The Jacarandas. I don't know if you've ever seen these beautiful trees with purple flowers. Well, the main street of the small city of Butare is lined with jacarandas, and the trees really are a character in the book, not only because they're so beautiful, but also because they symbolize the dusk hours where the character uh, Immaculata, the grandmother, uh, tells uh, her children stories before putting them to bed. And they sit on a balcony on a bench under the jacaranda, and uh, she tells them stories that are going to buoy them up uh, throughout their existence. Jacaranda is also a very symbolic tree, I have to say. Uh, I thought it was an African tree when I was small, but it actually came from Brazil, and it was brought to Africa by the colonialists. And for some places in the world, it's a symbol of colonialism, especially in southern Africa. So when I began to read the book, I didn't know this. I, I was just thinking about the beauty of the tree itself and their presence. And when I looked into it a bit, more closely, I saw that uh, in uh, South Africa, Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, they decided to rip them out because they had been left there by the uh, colonizers. So this is a, a theme in the book. What do we do with the traces that that history, colonial history, has left behind? Should we rip it out? Should we throw it all away? Or should we try to own the story in a new way, the history in a new way, and see what can intrinsically belong to us. You talked about the dusk hour. 
I'm going to use your test because I think you use a lot of beautiful images. You talk about the dusk hour and the crepuscular hour, and you compare this to um, a blending of cultures and uh, mixed race. You talk about it as being uh, crystalline. At the beginning of the book, we see Blanche, who's a young woman born in Rwanda who arrived in France in 1994 at the same age that you had, you were when you arrived in, now she's a bit older, and who is uh, heading towards her family home without having forewarned her mother. Before we learn about Blanche, what we're interested in is the mix, the, the melting pot of your language. We are struck by all of the Rwandan words that you slip into the text. And let me just, as an aside, quickly say that uh, we had a translator here at Mishaski who grew up in Benin and told us how in when she was a child, she was reading Proust. And uh, the elm trees uh, were something that reminded her of her country, even though they didn't have elm trees in Benin. Uh, so, uh, and it transported her to France as well. So I think that although your text is harsh and dark, there is a, a great deal of beauty uh, through these images which help us to transcend uh, the events. But uh, first, a word about language. Was it natural for you to blend different languages into your writing? It was absolutely essential because this uh, blending of languages was important in, in itself. But uh, what you were saying about Proust reminded me that of a Adichie gave a lecture and said that when she was small, she read a lot. And when she started to write, uh, she wrote stories, the kind of stories you might write when you're a teenager, in which people talked about the weather or eating an apple, even though this had nothing to do with her daily life. So I think our generation of African writers or Af uh, writers of descendants of Africa uh, know a lot about Western literature because we learned about it when we were young. Sometimes it was difficult for us to relate to it. And today, our generation is now feeding the world imagination with our stories, where we're not talking about apples, but mangoes where we're not talking about elm trees, but jacarandas. And it was important for me to do this with the Kinrawandwa, which is my mother tongue. If you are not familiar with Rwanda, it's a very small country with only one language, which is very different from many African countries where there are a great number of languages or dialects because these countries are uh, were put together pell-mell through the colonial period. Uh, Rwanda had the same uh, borders before and after colonization, were uh, of the only countries in that part of Africa that was colonized. And the Kinyua Rwanda has a very important, uh, the, the language has a very important uh, oral tradition, a tradition of poetry. The Limagana was the, um, the mother, the founder of this poetry. So, Yes, I learned uh, to read and write in French, but the Rwandan language nourishes, nurtures my imagination. And even though I write in French, I need to have that language available to me. And I'd like other people to be able to have access to it too. Because Rwanda came under the Occidental, the Western gaze, only in 1994 when the genocide took place. It's a pity that uh, we are only known through such a terrible event. So my literature aims 
This is why I talk about before and after and less about what happened during the genocide. Uh, it's important for me to say, well, we have a story, uh, history. We're people just like everybody else. We're people with family uh, issues, with a culture that pre-existed the events. This needs to be heard, and we don't want to be reduced to the genocide, which uh, has been the object of a lot of uh, caricatures uh, in the media and in the public gaze. And my very first book of short stories is entitled uh, Ajo, which is a Rwandan word, the same word in our language to say, which we used to say yesterday and tomorrow. And it was my way of explaining how we see time and also see what our language can contribute to the world imagination, to global imagination. So enriching uh, our imagination to get away from the uh, Western gaze. Yes, the Western gaze and the colonial gaze. It's one way of opening the spectrum, enlarging the spectrum of what we're usually able to hear and see. And that's even more important in, in that I'm, I'm not a historian, so I'm not going to give you a master class on the genocide, but our story has been told by others, mainly by others. We were first colonized by the Germans briefly, and then the Belgians arrived with a very 19th century uh, attitude, equality between the races, and they arrived in Rwanda and didn't understand the society. They were Hutus and Tutsis, but they're not ethnic groups because we have the same culture, the same language. It was about clans, and that led to the colonizers thinking that we were different ethnic groups. The, Hutus arri the Tutsis arrived after the Hutus, uh, descendants of the Amites, and that was a false interpretation, but we believed it. We started to teach it, and one century exactly after the arrival of the first whites in Rwanda, the genocide began. So the narrative that others use to describe us is something that we often take on ourselves, and uh, look what can happen, part of the population killing the other part. So the narrative is powerful. And we need to go to our language, to our proverbs. Proverbs are also very highly present in my work. Uh, we need to look at the way that we tell our, his, our story in, and the way we see the future from that respect is also important, perhaps uh, more important than in other parts of the world. We, we'll come back to what you have to say about the presence of uh, foreigners and the French uh, uh, before and after the genocide and the way the genocide has been recounted uh, from the uh, perspective of before and after as well. But I'd like to come back to the opening scene of the book so that we can talk a bit more about the text and compare Blanche getting into a taxi to go to her mother's house, her, fa her childhood home. She has a huge identity problem, and she's afraid that she won't be recognized as uh, a member of the family and a member of the society. Can we ask you, could I ask you to uh, explain Blanche a, a bit and her mother Immaculata and the little family ecosystem? Well, the family is in, sh in tatters, in shreds. The grandmother, Immaculata, grew up uh, just after independence in the period where Western progress was thought to be the solution to the future. And the situation for uh, the best the best solution for the country. Her first husband was French, and she has Blanche with him. And I don't want to tell the whole story, but the, they're separated, she and her husband, and she has a second, son, a second child who's Bosco with another uh, man. So she, she has Bosco with her childhood sweetheart, who's a Hutu, and she ends up uh, raising her two, two, two children alone. Then the civil war breaks out. Bosco 
because there's a misunderstanding, because he doesn't know the story of his father, uh, goes to join the Rwanda Patriotic Front, which is trying to take back the country. And then the genocide uh, begins in 1994. And Immaculata manages to say to Blanche, your skin is light, leave the country, go find your father in France. So Blanche leaves on the first day of the genocide. Or the, and the story really starts on 1997 when she comes back to Rwanda to uh, rejoin her, her mother and her brother who survived the war. And the whole novel then looks at how this family, which is uh, has completely fallen apart, can rebuild its ties. It's a universal story in the sense that uh, the, um, the important thing is silence. We talked a lot about silence yesterday uh, in other sessions. Uh, how can we find words that heal, words that uh, create ties and bonds? and lift the lid off of the uh, sorrow. Because what happened is in the story is that there's the initial story, uh, which the mother doesn't tell her children about who their fathers were. She was just trying to protect them, as many of us do with our children. Then there's another silence about the genocide, and another one which I won't describe, but uh, which adds another layer of silence, and we have a proverb in my country which says the neck is the cover of, uh, is the lid on sorrow. So Blanche's struggle will be to take off that lid uh, of her mother's sorrow and put words on uh, the silence. So that's what the opening scene is about when she comes back to Butari. Her name is Blanche. Her skin is light. Uh, Blanche and I, our experiences are different because in 1994, I lived through the genocide and I was able to leave the country only uh, in June of that year. And since I'm in Switzerland, I think I should say and pay tribute to pe the people who saved my life. A Swiss couple, Alexi and Diane Briquet, who worked for Terre des Hommes. Sorry, I'm a bit uh, emotional. Two humanitarian workers who were incredibly crazy and decided to get a convoy together. The whole world uh, ha was trying desperately not to see what was going on, and they arrived in Rwanda with uh, very few means, but a lot of energy. And they organized convoys, uh, to s and they saved several hundred children this way, Tutsi children. And so hidden in a Terre des Hommes convoy, Convoy, I was able to leave Rwanda thanks to the, this Swiss couple. Alexi died last year in December. I had just started to search for them. The uh, lockdown was over, and I thought, what can I do that would be important? And I thought, I need to find them. I need to find the other children in the convoy. I had found uh, some photos that BBC journalists took on the border when we uh, crossed over into Burundi on the 18th of June. Sorry, I'm not talking about the novel at all anymore, I'm, but I'm in Switzerland and I really wanted to thank them because n they're nameless and faceless, uh, Alexi and his wife, but several hundred uh, other children like me were saved thanks to them. So now I don't know what we were talking about. Yes, okay, so let me remind you, uh, no, let, let's, talk about weaving. Weaving is a powerful image in the book. Anastasia, the, the mother of Immaculata, was a weaver. You've been talking about a family in tatters. Uh, Alexei and his wife who tried to piece something together. Um, so that's an important concept for you. When, you. when we look at the etymology of the word text, it's textum, comes from textum in Latin. Uh, from the verb texere, which means to weave. So when you you write, are you weaving? 
Did, is this a woven book? Did the weaving enable you to reconnect the pieces, uh, find the pieces of the puzzle and put them in the right places? How is writing a novel based on your own experience? To, to what extent was, did the act of writing enable you to bring, uh, put together this patchwork which uh, is probably very important to you with, uh, and your own history. Well, there are several answers to that. Uh, first of all, people have often asked me, is writing a catharsis for you? And uh, I have to say no. I, I chose fiction. Uh, there are other survivors writing their stories. But the idea of weaving well, I'd say that for me, uh, the writing is uh, like a repair room. Why? When I arrived in France in 1994, and this was the case for a lot of survivors, and it's the case for Immaculata when she comes out of the basement where she was hiding. She wants to talk. She wants to tell people what happened. She wants to hear from others who uh, was killed and how. And she, and, and her son says, she was verbally incontinent. And I remember that a lot of us were like that. We needed to talk and talk and talk. But there was no place for these accounts because it was too difficult for the rest of the world to hear. And often, and it's a platitude that was used after the Shoah to uh, that we, uh, to talk about the unspeakable. Uh, and I would say it's not so much unspeakable as unhearable. It took me a while to realize this, and it's a bit strange because uh, afterwards, when I wanted to do something useful in my life, I went into humanitarian affairs and I worked. Uh, on AIDS, I worked with uh, HIV positive people, and we talked about uh, if people could hear, how, if they could hear this diagnosis, and if society could hear it and face it. So, working with survivors of AIDS, I thought a lot about what people are able to hear and all of the representations we have, the images we have, because we talk about uh, reputations, uh, rep uh, images that people put on you and how they stick. So it's taken me all of these years to get, in a way, uh, rebuild my life, but also uh, contribute to these stories being hearable because I had things to say, but I didn't know where to say them. I didn't have an outlet. And this happened after the Holocaust as well. There were people who wanted to tell their stories, who wrote them down. But at that time, it was just not possible to, to tell them. Uh, the ones that were published were met with a certain level of indifference. So it's literature for me that gives me uh, f that form of expression. And I hope it's accessible and hearable for my readers. It's a an, uh, you, you can repair a country, but how can you repair the hearts of the people? And you can only do that, I think, if, uh, if people really want to listen and see us all as human beings. Uh, I think that, and I say this in one of my stories in Ejo, people say, how are you? How are you? They never listen to what you say. If, what if you want to say, I'm not, I'm not doing well? Well, there's a silence in the conversation and people don't know what to say. So this shows us how, uh, I mean, humans are not always ready to hear the answers if they can't even hear the answer to how are you, how, are you? how is your pain, do they really want to know? 
Let me open a parenthesis here. Uh, let me remind the audience that you can ask questions. And the information is on the website of the foundation uh, to reach us via WhatsApp. So, do you see yourself as the intermediary between do you, the piece of the loom that goes back and forth with the thread as an author and a woman of two different cultures? Do you see yourself as a uh, as a uh, some as the intermediary, no, I don't have that impression. Uh, at least I'm not alone. I think many of us are doing that. When you set out to write a book, it's because you want people to hear your his your story, and the mixing of cultures. Uh, the idea that it means living on the border and being uh, somebody who helps people go from one side to the other, but not the kind of uh, person who takes advantage of people's misery and desperation, uh, like what's happening in the Mediterranean right now. I was supposed to be with my feminist friends yesterday in Nice for an operation called Tuto Frontière. Uh, about the role of women in migration and uh, everything that they go through. But when I say, uh, talk about being a passer, it's somebody who's opening the border because I know what's happening on both sides. And even linguistically, with all the subtle subtleties of language, all of the little, sig the little signifiers in the language, I can, I can uh, help people understand that, and maybe that can lead to reparation, to mending, because uh, we have spent centuries putting up borders and we're still doing it every day. Uh, words can be kites that fly over the border. The fact that I've chosen fiction, even though it is in a way a personal testimonial, is that when you read a story told by somebody at the other side, on the other side of the world, you often think, well, this is not my story. This happens, uh, this is taking place on the other side of the world. And, and there are a lot of images about Africa because the collective uh, stereotypes are very strong, especially in France. But when you read a novel, you must identify with the characters. And this idea that it's not my story, it's happening on the other side of the world, often is forgotten. And what I try to do is to take the reader by the hand without frightening them and taking them to the edge of the abyss of our existence. By that time, they're already taken in by the story. They want to know what's going to happen to the characters. They've identified with them. And then they understand where the abyss is uh, in the experience of these characters, dehumanization, extermination, and only literature, in my opinion, can do that. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. Yes, absolutely. You spoke about uh, your ability, you spoke about stereotypes, the way a certain number of uh, uh, things are um, perceived. There's the scene at the beginning of the book. We haven't spoken about uh, Stokli yet, but so let's go back in time. The reason why Blanche wants to establish this dialogue, wants to care for this dialogue with her mother is her son, Stokli. He inherits uh, another kind of uh, uh, blend of uh, cultures. You can't. You say somewhere you can't be uh, unrooted if you know where you're coming from, and that's what. Uh, that's the reason why Blanche wants uh, to uh, free her thought. It's for her son, and there's Emery Curtis. The scene that is uh, extremely true and sad. 
Well, I can speak a little bit about myself before speaking about Stokli, and once again, it's uh, the experience of uh, the blend of cultures. When I was in Rwanda, uh, people perceived me as being white, uh, but I was living in my mother's family. My mother's family was black. I grew up in a city that had uh, two libraries, uh, one bookstore. What's uh, this Western world that I'm being subsumed to? And when I got to France, people saw me, people perceived me as being black. And once again, uh, I went back to the books. Uh, there's this notion that books can can be your allies. They help you build your identity. And I went back to Afro-Caribbean literature to see what it meant to be black in a white man's eyes. Chamoiseau, uh, Marais Condé, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, as well uh, as uh, the authors of the African diaspora in France. And then my third literary family were survivors of the Shoah, people who'd survived the concentration camps, Cartes, Charlotte Delbo, George Saint-Prin, who was deported because uh, he was a resistant fighter, Alain Fuss, who is not very well known in the Western world, but all these people helped me understand what it meant to survive a genocide attempt. Stokely is Blanche's son. When she gets to France, she's got a lover called Samora, who is also half-race. His uh, mother is French. His father comes from the Martinique of the Antilles. And he wants to be seen as a child when, in actual fact, uh, in southwestern France, he's perceived as uh, being black. Uh, Samora changes his name to Samora as a tribute to Samora Machel, uh, one of the fathers of independence. And when they have this child, uh, they decide to call him Stokely as a tribute to uh, Stokely Carmichael. This child grows up with uh, a mother who's experienced Rwanda, Rwanda France, both sides of uh, the blend of cultures. And this father, who is black, who has chosen, who's been assigned this role as the black man in his uh, region, his mother will open him up to literature to help him understand. And that's what is going to help him establish a link with his grandmother, although there are sometimes misunderstandings. Uh, he's in high school. A Shoah survivor comes uh, to uh, uh, tell about uh, his experience. Uh, he strictly wants to uh, tell him about his experience because he sees uh, uh, similarities and the Shoah survivor doesn't see it uh, because it's Africa, because there are all these representations about Africa. These are things that were said in 1994. Uh, we've always killed each other. They've always killed each other. It's a political discourse, a propaganda that's been uh, used over the years. Uh, there's a heart of darkness that uh, people talk about when speaking about Africa. There's also Bosco, Blanche's brother. He is also half race, half Hutu, half Tutsi. He is going to go to war. I won't say much more to avoid spoiling it for you, but just a word about uh, the presence of uh, Western NGOs during the genocide. In a couple of instances, uh, you say that there have been misunderstandings, uh, stereotypes uh, uh, that didn't correspond to the reality in the field. There was life before and life after. I'm thinking about uh, 
Blanche's husband and his stay in Rwanda, uh, which is like a series of postcards, as you say, there are all the landscapes. It's, uh, there, there's uh, these exotic landscapes, there's the devastation, the violence. It's hard to think about something else than violence when we think of Rwanda. And I think literature is going to help us do that in addition to everything else, at least your literature. It's your literary undertaking. Yes, cer most certainly. The point is to deconstruct uh, in the Occidental gaze. Imaginary images uh, take ownership of one's history, say it in one's own words. At the beginning, I'd started with uh, short stories exactly for this reason. I heard so many people who'd read one testimonial and speak about the African woman, the people who go and spend a week in Senegal, come back and think they've understood the whole of Africa. Uh, there's a website called Africa is a Country, and there's still people to ask you, do you speak African? Uh, no, Africa is 54 countries, uh, 54 different sto uh, histories. And this requires a lot of work if we want to deconstruct all of this. It can only be done because we tell our stories now, and the more stories there are, the better it will be. It's very important to say so in the publishing world. Uh, people still tell you, well, we already have a, a Rwandan writer. We already have a writer from Cameroon. Uh, can this be said to a writer from Paris, uh, from Geneva? We already have such a writer in our catalog. That's not the way things are. There are so many different stories. I think it was uh, yesterday someone here said, we've understood the Shoah. I've read four or five books and I've understood the Shoah, when in actual fact it would take six million books to understand the Shoah. With other African writers, uh, we're trying to think about uh, how we can best support the coming generation with uh, creative writing workshops uh, so that there are more and more stories that are published. We're not content with uh, what the publishing world says, that we already have women, we already have African women. No. Uh, it's a, an act of activism. More there are story, the more stories there are, the more points of view there are, the less stereotypes there will be that lock us up. Uh, people read one book and they get the feeling that they know it all, that they've understood it all, that uh, they know the soul of the people, as Nicolas Bouvier said. Uh, give me the soul of your people. No, that's impossible. Since we're speaking about the publishing world, do you think uh, the situation is uh, changing? I'm thinking about Les Impatientes. That was published by Emmanuel Collin, which had a, a great uh, journey. Do you think uh, things are changing? Do you think uh, readers, in addition to the publishing world, are... I think readers are very much open. They're ready to discover many different things. What I find interesting uh, I read a lot of uh, English-speaking literature, and uh, I'm very eager to see what's happening over there, what's happening in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa. These are things that come from there. Uh, there are language silos. A uh, Rwandan playwright told me it's quite dramatic. Uh, uh, I grew up in Rwanda, and I never heard uh, about uh, Kenyan writers. 
It's a neighboring country, but because it's an English-speaking country, we've uh, heard about these writers at a very late stage last year, and that's one of the positive uh, consequences uh, of the pandemic. But we've had to reinvent a certain number of things. And because we were on, inter on the internet uh, all the time, we organized a festival. Uh, we were able to dialogue between French-speaking, English-speaking, Portuguese-speaking writers and go beyond these language borders. But in uh, with French-speaking writers, uh, there's this thing you have to go uh, through Paris uh, you've got to have the Paris uh, stamp, be rubber stamped by Paris, whereas uh, in the English-speaking world, there are journals where you can start publishing uh, much more easily. So it's uh, going to take time. We need readers. We need readership, uh, not only in Western countries. When I write, I write as much for the people of Rwanda uh, as for the rest of the world. I like to quote a sentence that I've read in an essay by Zadie Smith. It says, uh, good literature is there to comfort the deranged and uh, discomfort uh, those who have certainties. That's exactly it. That's the entire point. That's what we need to be doing. Hence the, hence the French language, Kenya, Rwanda, and all these languages. I spoke about this uh, with someone a while ago. There's a uh, chamoiseau and uh, oraliture. I know the Rwandan oral tradition. There's the Western literature. And uh, uh, literature uh, is uh, this loom. Uh, we need to deconstruct a certain number of stereotypes uh, that are very much, uh, that are deeply rooted. Thank you very much. I think I'll soon turn to the Q&A. But maybe to finish, uh, with my questions. Uh, you said you worked for NGOs. You maybe still work uh, for NGOs. Uh, you've uh, acknowledged uh, the NGO that helped you leave uh, Rwanda in the 90s. What do you think of the NGOs uh, as a uh, uh, counter power in Rwanda? Uh, you speak about them in your book. Can you say a little bit more about them? Very briefly? Well, I'll answer, I'll give the same answer as Andres a while ago. Uh, it's a very good question, but I don't think I can answer this question right now, at least not in five minutes. There are a whole lot of people who work for NGOs because they want to change the world. They really want to make a difference. But sometimes, it's like homeopathy. You, if you don't fight against the root cause, then it's to no avail. How come an NGO can have a greater budget than the whole Ministry of Health in a country? Uh, that's an issue. That's a problem. And very often, I realize when I work for uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders in Switzerland, uh, th there is this link between me and Switzerland. Uh, and I did think that they were doing incredible work, but uh, uh, there's the whole issue of failed state, how uh, they got to be failed state, uh, how they can come out of the impasse. Uh, uh, I worked on the campaign for access to uh, essential medicines, the issue of patents for uh, tri-therapy. It is so topical when we see uh, the COVID-19 vaccines and the issue of lifting the patents. It, it's an endless story. It's very political in nature, very financial in nature. And I can't speak conclusively about this issue. 
I would like to suggest that we move on to something else. Uh, there's a sentence that I really liked uh, about that I really liked about Kenya of Rwanda. You say it's a language that is full of uh, uh, nooks and corners and hiding places. How come this uh, language is the way you describe it? I think there's as much that is said as it is silenced. It's the way we speak and it's the way I write. It has nothing to do with the unspeakable I mentioned a while ago. What's at stake here is uh, a culture where you resort to metaphors, to similes, to images, to say things. Uh, it's also in the way uh, the genocide was told by other people. There were some short stories that I wrote as a reaction because that's not the way we speak in Rwanda. But after a story such as this, how do you reinvent language? Cartesh worked a lot on this and tried to find a different type of language to speak about the Shoah. So how can we reinvent the language without uh, forgetting where you come from, how you speak, to share it with the rest of the world? But it's a beautiful language. It's a language that has its secrets. There is a proverb that uh, Blanche mentions in a dialogue with her mother. When someone hides from you that he hates you, hide the fact that you've realized it. How can you build a society on that basis? Of course, there are so many things that we can explore through literature, and each proverb can be the beginning of a story. The presence of Kinyi Rwanda has to do with uh, the things that cannot be translated. Its presence it's ex is extremely important in the text. I'm in touch with people who are working on translations of my novel, and it's quite interesting. Uh, there is a translator who told me, I, you, you, know, you know Chip? You know this sound? It's a sound that we find in all black diasporas uh, in the Americas, in North America. How can you translate this? Uh, you chip in all quarters of the world, uh, even people who are not of African descent use it. How can that be translated? Uh, this nations, and it was extremely interesting. I don't know whether, like Andres, once I read the translations of my novel, I might change the original text in French. Thank you, thank you very much, Beata Mbeimeres. A beautiful book. I see Eric coming closer. There might be questions from the audience. I'll read it to you. Hello, thanks for this uh, meeting. I appreciated uh, Ejo and tous tes enfants dispersés. What do you mean by caricature genocide? At the start of this entire story, there is a misunderstanding, as I said. People said there's a, a ethnic, uh, ethnic group X, ethnic group Y, which was not true. And the point is uh, to tell the story as it was. I'm not sure I understand the question properly, but I think it's quite universal. Uh, you always want to deconstruct caricatures. 
and to uh, deconstruct uh, assigned identities as a woman, as a white person, as a Tutsi, as a Hutu. That's what we constantly try to do. I don't know about you, but I'm always trying to deconstruct caricatures and uh, re representations. Sometimes I play with those. When people think I'm from North Africa and I say, well, no, I'm half Polish, half London. I love these uh, moments in time when people realize all of a sudden that they were completely wrong about me. I don't know if that really answers the question. I'm turning uh, to the audience in the room to see whether there are any questions. It does not seem to be the case, so let's close here. Thank you very much, Beata. Thank you. And have uh, a good day and a good festival. Thank you.